Classically, the policy and value functions have been represented using tables. But tables can only take you so far. They don't scale to problems with large state spaces or even continuous state spaces. They don't generalize to similar states. A more modern approach is to use neural networks as they have proven their ability to learn very complex behavior. Let's see how we can apply neural networks to the same algorithms we have studied till now and train this card pull problem. Welcome to the fourth video of this series where we will be introducing neural networks into reinforcement learning for the first time. Welcome to Campus X. Subscribe to keep following this series. Sit back, relax and learn. We begin our study of function approximation and reinforcement learning. Function approximators are some parameterized functions which try to approximate an actual function. An approximate value function can be represented using VSW where W are the parameters of this approximator. You can think of VSW as a neural network and W its weights and biases. As simple as that. VSW tries to approximate the true value function here represented using VPIS. We use supervised learning techniques to train these approximators as these techniques have proven very capable in doing so. Function approximation has many advantages. The first one being lowering memory requirements. To store our value or policy function, we need to store only the parameters of this approximator. Whereas in the tabular case, we had to store the whole table, which would take up a lot more memory. Another advantage is that function approximators generalize to similar states. When a single state is updated, the chain generalizes from that to affect the values of many other states. This generalization makes the learning more powerful, but difficult to manage and understand. Now let's take a side step to understand a fundamental element of calculus, the gradient. People often get confused as to what the gradient refers to and many of our supervised learning algorithms make use of that. So this side step can really bring everyone on the same page before we move on to the algorithms that make use of it. Mathematically, the slope of a line refers to a number that describes the steepness of the line. The slope is positive if the line is slanted to the right. The slope is negative if the line is slanted to the left. But what would it mean to find the slope for a curvy function like this? The slopes would be changing at different points. The slope for this point can be found out by finding the slope of the tangent drawn at that point. Taking this concept to three dimensions, the slope of this surface at a particular point can be given by the slope of the plane at that point. This slope is called gradient. Gradient is just a fancy alias for slope at higher dimensions. But what the gradient gives us is the direction of steepest ascent, which means if you move in the direction mentioned by the gradient, the surface will have more values. People try to model this surface as a lost surface and then navigate to a minima by using the gradients so as to minimize loss. Our loss function can be a mean squared error between the true values and the approximate values. If we take the gradient of this quantity, we would get the direction of steepest ascent on the loss surface. But our goal is to minimize the loss. Therefore, we take the steps in the reverse direction of the gradient by updating our parameters and end up in a minimum. Taking a whole step given by the gradient is not feasible. That's why people use learning rate alpha and some constants to balance out the equation when the loss is opened up like this using high school calculus. This method of the cunning use of gradients to minimize loss is known as stochastic gradient descent. Sounds familiar? But the main challenge here is we don't know what the true values are. If we would have already known the true values, there was no point of learning, right? Since the true values are not known, the real question is what do we fill up in this empty space? What will be our target? We can fill up a quantity ut which is not the true value but possibly some random approximation to it. It can be a noise corrupted version of the true values or it can be one of our bootstrapping targets which TD methods use. The point is ut has to be an unbiased estimate of the true values. By that I mean expected value of ut should result in the true values otherwise convergence is not guaranteed. That's why these methods are called semi-gradient methods instead of stochastic gradient methods. Here are two algorithms for policy evaluation. The first one is a Monte Carlo evaluation. You will notice that the structure of the algorithm is the same, only we have added function approximators to it. 
In the Monte Carlo update, we have added our gradient which helps our approximator to learn the actual return. We can do the same with a TD method where we use our bootstrapping targets. But how would SARSA differ? Let's find out. We begin with the initializations of our action value function, our algorithm parameters and the parameters of our value function. For each episode, we start with a starting state and an action. For every step of the episode, we take the action and observe reward R and the next state is dash. We choose our next action from our epsilon greedy policy, then apply our SARSA update directed by our gradients. We then make the next action and state as our current action and state. If our s dash was terminal, we would like to update the parameters a little differently. This time we consider our target to be just the reward. And then we go to the next episode. Let's put this algorithm to test and train an agent using it. We choose the cart pole problem. The aim of this task is to balance the pole just by moving the cart. It is one of the hello world problems of reinforcement learning and one can derive a great deal of understanding of RL from this environment. We will visit the gym documentation to find out how this environment is implemented. We navigate to classic control and then cart pole. We right away see the description for this environment. Our action space are two discrete integers 0 and 1. Our observation is a vector of four elements and how we can import this environment. Cartpole v1 is the name of this environment. Our action space uh, consists of two actions, zero, which means push the cart to the left. One is push the cart to the right. Our observation shape consists of four elements. The first one is cart position, then cart velocity, pole angle, pole angular velocity. Since our goal is to keep the pole upright for as long as possible, we give a reward of plus 1 for every step taken. Our episode only terminates if any of the following three things occur. If the pole angle is greater than plus minus 12 or if the cart position is greater than plus minus 2.4 or if the episode length is greater than 500. It's 200 for V0. If any of the three things occur, the episode terminates. Our current version is V1. So that's the description for this environment. Let's get coding. The first thing we will need is TensorFlow. Since we are going to use neural networks, we will need TensorFlow. So I'll go to my interpreter settings and add a package to it. I'll hit this plus button and write TensorFlow. The current version is 2.9.1 and I'll install. Now that we have installed TensorFlow, the first thing we'll notice that the code for the last video is gone. I have deleted them for this branch. It's on a branch part four for this current video and you will find the code for uh, part three in branch three. Okay. So let's start by coding a random agent. Random agent. We'll start by importing Jim and OpenCV to display our frames to our audience. We'll start by importing TensorFlow and we'll keep everything in TensorFlow instead of NumPy as TensorFlow methods can use GPUs to accelerate if you have them, I don't. We'll start by importing Jim and creating, no, I'll start by making the environment cartpool v1 for episode in range of 5. I would like to see 5 random episodes. We will initialize our done variable to false. We will start with resetting our environment and catching the initial state. For every step of the episode, the first thing we will do is use our render method to render a frame to the console or uh, to the, yeah, whatever, to the audience. But this time we will use render mode RGB array. What this returns me is a numpy array. And basically, it's a frame which we can show to the audience using OpenCV. I'll give the name cart pole and I'll show it to my audience. I'll add a weight key of um, 100 milliseconds. So I'll get 10 frames per second. Next, we will select our action randomly from 0 and 1. So I'll use tf.random.uniform 
I'll have a shape of Z, uh, an open tuple or an empty tuple. That's because we need only a scalar tensor. Uh, scalar tensor sounds bad, but I need only a scalar value. Okay, so min val equal to zero, max val equal to two. D type. We need to also give the D type because the uh, default D type is float, which we don't want. And at last, since this returns me a tensor of just a single number, I would like to get the integer value of that, which so we write the numpy method. What it does, if it's a tensor of multiple dimensions, it converts it to a numpy array. If it's a scalar, it turn, converts it into an integer. Then we'll use our step method to take the action in the environment and what we'll get is the next state, the reward, done and some bookkeeping information. At last, we'll do an env.close. And what we also need to do, if you are um, using Jim, and after Jim, you have not written this. So open up your terminal and install Jim Classic Control. Okay, for some reason, the library package does not come with PyGim and installing this uh, installs all the dependencies for um, whatever actually it should be pip install I am still misspelling install gym classic control okay don't misspell that and it uh, satisfies all the requirements like pygame and all which comes with the classic control version of this so let's right click and run it gives me some warnings uh, because I don't have CUDA and all and there will be some deprecation notices which comes from tensorflow nothing i can handle so you will notice that our random agent is performing its task <laughs> it's random so the pole is toppling over and also what you'll notice is when you start the environment there comes two things two windows the first one is a pygame window and the next one is our frame. So here is a pygame window which I could not figure out how to get rid of. It actually is a problem with pygame and comes up every time. Gym guys are also figuring that out. Now let's see how we can apply our semi gradient sarsa here. So we'll start by creating a new python file and name it sarsa cart pull. Sounds like a reasonable name to me. We will start by importing Jim and import TensorFlow. The first thing we'll do is create the environment cartpool v1. Then we will initialize our queue. Uh, I can say I cannot say table. It's a network now. Our action value function. The first thing we're going to need is uh, an input layer of shape 4 comma because our observation is a vector of 4 uh, elements and right away I see I don't have input layer imported so from Keras I will import model since we are here let's import some other things too so I'll import input and we will need dense layer. So from layers, I'll import tens. After we have our input tensor, we would like to pass it through 64 units of tens. I'll pass, give it an activation of ReLU. Our input tensor will get connected to X. And we will need another, we'll keep another tens layer activation with activation value and I'll again store it back to X at last we'll have our output layer which will have only two units because our Q network will output the values for each of our action two actions the activation by default is linear but let me just make it explicit linear and it comes from X so let's create our queue network using our model. Our inputs, uh, net input is net input, and our output is output. 
So our Q network is our first we have 1064 units, then 32 units and at last we have 102. Let's initialize parameters. We'll start initializing alpha which is 0 0.001. Why that number? I'll explain it later. Epsilon of 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 then our gamma of 0 0.99 we are using 0 0.99 here instead of 0 0.9 and num episodes episodes um let's train it for 500 episodes before jumping onto the training loop let's first write down our policy function we will start with taking in the state and our explore parameter next we need to select actions uh, first optimally Right. So what we'll do is to the Q network, I will pass in the state. Now what TensorFlow or KRS requires the input of this network is not just a single observation, like single uh, tensor of shape four. It requires a batch of shapes, a batch of observations. So the way we can model this batch is, um, let's say we pass only one observation in a batch. So our effective tensor would be the tensor shape would be uh, one comma four. That's what I'm expecting in this state variable. The output is actually uh, a batch of those observations that you gave. So it will be one comma two, two being the number of actions or the Q values. Okay. So from this tensor of shape one comma two, I need to get out the first element because there is only one element or yeah one one set of actions set of values and then we can use the tf.argmax function to find out which action has the most value and i will also need to mention an output type because the default output type is float 32 and we've mentioned tf.in32 because we want our actions to be action our action to be an integer now with probability epsilon, I would like to randomly select an action. I'm using the uniform function here and I'm mentioning the max value should be one. So it returns me uh, uniformly randomly from an integer from zero to one actually returns me a scalar. If this value is less than equal to explore, then with probability explore, I would need to do something in this if. Here we will select an action randomly and we will use the same uniform function that TensorFlow gives us and we will have a shape of uh, empty tensor, uh, empty tuple. Our minimum value is 0, our maximum value is 2, our D type is tf.in32. This time I am careful with the maximum value, last time I messed up. <laughs> I will return my action. So this is my epsilon greedy policy. Let's start by writing our training loop. So for episode in range of num episodes, we have 500 episodes. We would like to initialize done with false. Then we will start by resetting the environment and catching our initial state. But as I mentioned earlier that Okay, I did make a mistake here. You guys probably have noticed it. As I mentioned that this policy requires the state to be batched, right? So right away, we will batch it up. And instead of using a Python list, we will right away convert it to a tensor as tensors are fast. Only if you're using hardware acceleration. Next, we will need to select our action from our current policy will give epsilon for every step of the episode we will take in the action and we'll pass in a dot numpy here because what it returns me is a scalar tensor or just a tensor and we need to convert it to an integer otherwise Jim will complain we will get back our next state our reward done and some bookkeeping information and we'll do the same with the next state what we did with the initial state and we will right away convert it to a tensor and batch it 
my state. So this is a batch of only one state. We need to select our next action from our current policy. So policy um, from next state and if silent. Next, we will create our targets. Our targets target is reward plus gamma into whatever our current action. Uh, sorry, whatever our next uh, Q value is from our next state. So this is a batch of states which has only one state. We are getting back a batch of uh, actions that we need to take, and we are taking the first element of that batch and. We will select the Q value what is given by our policy, the next action, uh, act for that action. But our targets uh, was a little different if our episode has already completed. If our episode has already completed, the done variable will hold true. So if our target, if the episode has finished, we want our target to be just the reward. Next, we will write a delta parameter which holds the difference between the target and the current. But where will we get the current from? We will have to pass it through our Q network. Pass, get the current uh, values. So state zero and action. So this is our current values. This is our where is our? This is our next values, or which is our target. But we would also like to uh, calculate the gradients for this. So with tf dot gradient tip. We will start recording all the TensorFlow operations or all the neural network operations that happens. This current holds a batch. Actually, I don't need to open this up here. I need to open this up here. Next, we'll calculate the gradients here. So, tape dot gradient. Gradient of the current vector, not concurrent current vector with respect to the parameters of my network so qnet or trainable weights next we need to update our uh, weights that's all that's required but this grads is a list so we need to loop over that list for j in range length of grads we would like to update our q value uh, our weights for our network so trainable weights j dot assign add whatever the alpha is into delta into grads for j. The reason we're using assign add here is because every weight of the layer is a tensorflow variable. So this wouldn't work. Plus equal to wouldn't work here, and we have to use the function assign add. We're uh, adding alpha into delta into whatever the grads is. The delta is the difference between target and our current. The only thing that's left is to make the next state and action as our current state and action. Next action. At last, we will close off of the environment. All right, now we would also like some metrics. So total reward. Our classic metrics episode length. Oh, come on. As soon as our step is complete, we will note down the reward for uh, that step plus equal to we'll add it to this total reward and episode length variable. Episode length plus equal to one. And at last, I will show the whatever the metric is for that current episode. Okay, so let's right click and run Sarsa card pool. All right, so we have our training results. We initially start off with length 100, uh, 10, 19. Our, init, our length should be 500, right? So if our agent is able to keep the pole upright for 500 we will consider the task is done but this does not seem to be the case even when i go to the end of the episode, uh, end of the training the agent did not learn for some reason <laughs> all right let's do some changes and see uh, if the agent learns or not
one problem might be that we have kept our epsilon fixed uh, maybe that's the reason it's not having enough exploration and after a few steps it's getting biased the network is getting biased so let's add an epsilon decay here okay so i'll have a parameter uh, i will initialize epsilon to zero and uh, i will decay the epsilon by 1.001 okay and after every episode i will decay the epsilon epsilon is by equal to epsilon decay so this is how i am decaying the epsilon and uh, let's put it down here and print out whatever the epsilon it was trained with epsilon epsilon whatever this episode was trained with and let's run it again and see how it performs now all right things seem to be working better now you can see rewards of 64 100 let's hope it get it gets trained by the time it's training let's uh, write an evaluator script which will take up our agent uh, we are okay for some reason we are not saving our queue network which we need to do so let's stop the training and save our queue network otherwise we will lose whatever we train so queue network dot save sarsa queue net okay and let's start again so once the network is saved it will be saved in a saved here in the form of a folder and what tensorflow can do and read this folder and load this queue network into variable so let's write down an evaluator script that if the agent gets trained it will use the same network and show it to the audience how the agent has learned or whatever the agent has learned we will create an evaluator script let's have the training going on in the background we will import gym we will need cp2 we will need tensorflow as tf and from kdes we will need uh, kdes.models we will need load model to load our queue network we will start by creating our environment cardpole v1 and we will load our uh, queue network load model sarsa queue we will have our epsilon greedy policy here, which I'm going to copy from this script. We have our policy. We would like to see four episodes. Episode in range of uh, five episodes, not four. Uh, we will initialize our done to false. We will get our initial state from reset and we will immediately convert it to a tensor after batching it. then while the episode is not complete we would like to render a frame and show it to the audience using mode rgb array cb2.im show card pole frame cb2.weight key of 100 we will select our action from our policy function policy function states and we will get our next state reward done after we take an action in the environment dot numpy then we will right away convert our state to a batched tensor and at last we will close off our environment env.close this is our evaluator script once our agent gets trained we will find out how the agent has learned all right we have our results uh, we start off initially with uh, randomly with the lengths are very low but even after 500 episodes the um, agent did not get trained even when the epsilon was 0.6 
Now you might think that the poll is getting unbalanced or disbalanced because of high epsilon and that might be the case. I even trained this with, uh, I even trained this for 3000 episodes but it did not get trained. Uh, now you might think that star size is an on-policy algorithm, so what if we use an off-policy algorithm for this, for example, Q-learning. So let's do that. I'll copy everything and I'll just make small changes to it. We will start by creating a new Python file. Q-learning. Cart poll. Keeping up with our naming conventions. And I'll paste everything here. The only things I need to change is action selection. It will be here and we don't need to select our action uh, from our policy, epsilon greedy policy. We need to select an optimal action. And let's train this. And okay, oh, one last thing before doing this is while we save our network, we need to write Q-learning. We'll save it with the name Q-learning QNet. Alright, after 5 minutes of training, we finally have our results and it seems like even Q-learning did not learn. Uh, let's see what our uh, evaluator function says, whatever these agents have learned. We have our two networks, one is for SARS and one is for Q-learning. We are loading our SARS network first. Alright, this is what our SARS network has learned. Okay, so it's not bad. It would have probably learned if I had trained more but it's very tedious. All right, that's fine. Let's see our Q-learning, Q-learning, Q-net. Okay, this is what our Q-learning has learned. So it turns out that both SARS and Q-learning did not learn this. And I did train with uh, 3000 episodes for both of these algorithms but it turns out that none of them learned. It turns out that there are very good reasons as to why this online learning is not working. The first one being we are using a non-linear function approximator. A neural network with non-linear activations is a non-linear function approximator. Because of this non-linearity, convergence is not guaranteed. Moreover, we don't know whether the bootstrapping targets we are using are unbiased estimates, which means whether expected UT is near the true values or not. There is no way of managing them. The second reason is, since this is an online learning scenario, we use sequences of states which might be very similar to update our networks in consequence steps. These sequences of states are highly correlated and introduce great variance in the network which breaks learning. The third reason is that we use only one experience sample to do our updates. One thing that SGD methods are known for is using mini batches. We are not taking advantage of that here, which makes the learning process very inefficient. The fourth reason is that we use an experience sample only once. Even on a static dataset, SGD methods take a lot of epochs to learn, but here we are throwing out the experience samples after one update only. These are the four major problems of our current method. There is one last problem according to me and that is we are applying the updates after every transition. If we could wait for let's say three or four transitions and then do the updates, it would be beneficial. This might not be clear as to why this might be a problem, but you can think a little hard to squeeze out why this is a problem. These are the problems which kept RL waiting for several years before coming to limelight. The algorithms that people use nowadays resolve some of these problems to a great extent and that's what we are going to study in the next episode. So stay tuned for the next one and see you there.